welcome everybody. So welcome everybody, if I can have your attention for a second. We're delighted to welcome you to the first official seminar of the Pedal Research Centre and the official launch day of the Pedal Research Centre. Uh, and we're fantastically fortunate to not only have the LEGO Foundation's support for the Pedal Research Centre, but also members of the family joining us here today in this very, very important inaugural event for the Research Centre. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. David Whitebread, who has been the intellectual lead on this project, along with Sarah Baker and Jenny Gibson, um, and who will come and tell us a little bit more about the Research Centre and what, what we're hoping to do with it. David. Thank you. There you go. Um, thank you, Anna. That's very, very kind. Uh, just, just before he may have to leave, I th just wanted to say that we're very privileged to have the model for the first <laughs> image on the P of pedal with us this afternoon. So. <laughs> Well, a special welcome to Solomon. Uh, <laughs> uh, if he gets too excited about what I'm going to say, he may, his mother may decide that um, <laughs> he, he may have had enough of intellectual debate for one afternoon. <laughs> but we're very pleased to see him. Thank you, Lysandra. Now, I've just got to work out how... No, that's not the right thing to do. That's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. That was you haven't got slides for this bit. Yeah, I've got slides, yeah. So what do I do? No, that's not right. Is it that one? That's the one. <coughs> ah, down, oh, ah, down and up. Right, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, if something weird happens, <laughs> yeah, uh, just 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 uh, take it that I'm playing. <laughs> um, this is really just a little introduction, just to first of all to welcome you all. Delighted to have such a rich, varied, and uh, powerful group as yourselves who are interested in this. Um, it's a particular joy to me that some, an area of work that I've been really interested in for a long time started right from the time that I was a psychology undergraduate and then a primary school teacher to be really, I uh, think, you know, I could say that i um, always been very enthusiastic about children, doing the best for children uh, and understanding them. They're con an en endlessly fascinating um, in the way they behave and so on. Um, but been particularly interested in the playfulness of children and indeed the playfulness of human beings. And it's a particular thrill to me for today, obviously, uh, coming together and finding that this is now a resurgent area of research and a resurgent area of interest, I think, across many uh, walks of life. Um, and delighted to have here fellow academics, uh, play advocates, uh, uh, senior members of the Lego Foundation and Lego Company particularly welcome as, as our uh, initial funders for the new centre. Um, and that so many people in different walks of life are getting excited again about play and playfulness and beginning to realise how important it might be is very exciting. Um, it's also um, a really important time for us to be doing serious research in this area um, uh, because actually arguably just at the very time in uh, human development when more than anything we need adults who are creative, who are problem solvers, who are thinkers, deep thinkers, people who can see things from different di directions and dimensions. Just at that very time when we look at what's happening in terms of children's childhood at the moment, particularly in modern westernised, urbanised societies, actually the opportunities for children's play are under serious um, threat. Um, over half the children in the world now live in an urban context. That's quite a staggering 
statistic, but apparently a true one. Um, and of course, that number is only going to increase. And there are particular issues, of course, about living in urban context. We did not evolve to live in urban context. We evolved to live as, as hunter-gatherers. And suddenly, we find ourselves in buildings and having meetings at specific times of the day. And you'll recognize all the paraphernalia of modern, modern life. Um, and there is a particular concern for children about the limited access to natural environments um, and what they learn from play in natural environments and so on. But certainly when I think back to my childhood, I'm not sure if I'm the oldest person in the room, but I'm sure many of you are old enough to remember a childhood that is really quite different. You know, a pre-internet childhood, a pre-Facebook childhood, uh, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and a childhood that was in many ways much freer and more playful than many of our children currently experience. Despite all the many developments, it is true that fewer children are living in poverty across the world than, than they were 50 years ago, and, and the United Nations um, have tracked this very carefully, and the report's coming out all the time. But nevertheless, there are still, as you will be sadly aware, there are still millions and millions and millions of young children who are living both in the developing world and, sadly, in the developed world, even in this country, um, in Europe, in America, and so on. There are many, many children living in abject poverty and suffering from malnutrition, and also, of course, inevitably, because their parents are finding it difficult to cope, uh, living in states of parental stress. We know there's a very large body of research evidence showing that this is a serious threat. The, the parents aren't playful, the carers aren't playful, and so the children aren't being played with in the same way that we would hope. Um, of course, in urban contexts, there are also parental perceptions of hazards and dangers, some real, some real traffic, some imagined to some extent. Uh, but nevertheless, we're tending uh, increasingly to live, to bring up children in a risk-averse uh, ob ob and over-supervised uh, you know, style of childhood, where any, every minute of the day there's an adult with them telling them what to do or in some way organising what them, they're doing or supervising. Um, the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and whole weekends that I spent on my own playing with my friends, who were equally playful and adventurous, I hope, um, that I was fortunate to experience, many children uh, still don't experience it. And to add to all that, um, that a lot of you know a lot of children's time is spent in schools, and what do they do in schools these days? When I was a primary school teacher between the the years of um, 1974 and 1986, um, we taught uh, children, I think, in many ways, just as well as they're taught now. The children certainly made excellent progress in all the schools I was involved in, and. It was an entirely playful, almost entirely playful curriculum. Uh, the opportunities for play in early childhood and primary school, particularly primary school uh, education these days, are seriously being curtailed by uh, an overemphasis, in my view, and the view of many, many commentators, um, uh, on academic learning and competitive testing. So um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that play is important. Um, I'm going to show a little bit about it in a moment. I wrote a report with uh, actually happily three of my, uh, well, two PhD students and one postdoctoral student who are all happily present here this afternoon, which I'm delighted to say. Um, and we wrote this uh, report uh, three or four years ago now and documented there's quite a body of evidence showing that um, children who are not, uh, children who are depressed or are not well or malnourished are not very playful, not very playful adults tend to be very unhappy and um, adults and so on, and that play is significantly and constantly associated with emotional well-being and with high levels of intellectual achievement. Uh, there are, of course, uh, huge gaps in the research. We don't know why that's the case. We don't know whether what the, what the direction of causality is. Uh, we don't know how it develops. We don't fully understand what kinds of um, precursors and outcomes can be attributed to play. But we certainly know it, it, we certainly have a lot of indicative evidence 
that it's very significant. Um, and we have evidence from a whole range of different uh, academic disciplines. Uh, within evolutionary psychology, uh, we know that playfulness doesn't just exist in humans, it exists in much simpler animals. Even some reptiles can be observed to engage in certain kinds of play. And certainly all mammals engage in physical play. Primates engage in play with objects. And of course, in humans, we engage in all kinds of symbolic pretense play, play with language, and so on. So there's been a kind of evolutionary development. We have been adapted. We are such a successful species, you know, at least in part, it would seem, because we're so playful. Um, anthropological studies, Peter Gray in America has done some really amazing work looking at children's unconstrained play in extant other hunter-gatherer societies, which still exist on the planet today, and children play all day, every day, um, and of course they learn through that how to be a successful and a contributory adult within, within their culture. Um, in neuroscience, now that we haven't managed to do any neuroscience on human children yet, but there's some really interesting work that's been done by a range of researchers looking at um, play in simpler mammals. And um, uh, in mice, for example, Pelis and Pelis have shown that particular types of play, mice engage in really two types of play. They engage in what's called uh, rough and tumble play. So they roll around a lot with other mice, with other baby mice and child mice. And if they don't do that, they become very bad parents. So they're learning a lot about emotional empathy, about how to care for one another, and so on and so forth. Some really important things by engaging in that kind of rough and tumble, chasing one another around and that sort of play that you'll see, of course, human children engaging in as well. They also play with toys. If you give them bells and balls and mirrors and all these sorts of things, you know, as you do, many of you have probably done that with your hamster when you were younger. <laughs> um, you know, again, uh, uh, they engage in that kind of play, and both those types of play lead to increased synaptic growth in specific areas of the, ma of the mouse brain, um, and they're important areas in terms of uh, their development and abilities. And within developmental psychology, we know, as I said earlier, that it's associated with cognitive ability and emotional well-being. We don't know the direction of causality. We know that playful parents um, who play around with language, make up silly words, silly rhymes with their children. That tends to support children's language development rather than um, and limit it. And we know that from some studies that early playfulness predicts um, uh, self-regulation, in other words, children's ability to um, control their own mental, be aware of and control their own mental processes, and certainly is predictive of academic, achieve academic achievement. Of course, what we don't understand is how that works, and that's crucial to know. Um, I've wrote in several places about my particular... People have categorised play in all sorts of different ways. I've written particularly about a particular system of doing that, looking at it sort of developmentally. Uh, the er earliest sort of play children develop, you'll see, is sort of sensory or physical play, um, all kinds of things they engage in. Th then you'll see round about as soon as a child can actually pick something up, and grasp something, you'll see them starting to play with objects in various ways, and eventually they finish up being creative problem solvers, so they finish up doing engineering at Cambridge, for example. Um, uh, or if they're going to become a classical musician, they learn very early on they play around with sounds and words and images. Um, I have to say, this is my all-time favourite child's drawing. I love children's drawings, the way they express meaning as they understand the world. This is about um, uh, how we all come to look like our pets. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a man and his dog. Despite the number of legs, this is supposed to be a dog <laughs> and not a spider. You'll be pleased to hear. It's taking for a walk. Um, and of course, probably the most researched area of, uh, of study in this area is pretense play, and this is unique to human beings. Um, dressing up, pretending one thing's another thing, making up pretense narratives, and so on and so forth, um, is a huge part of many children's childhood. Uh, and um, all the kinds of negotiation skills, 
uh, narrative skills, uh, imaginative skills, and so on, that are so important if you're going to be a creative, effective contributor to modern human society, uh, are right there. And, of course, finally, children love playing games with rules and, indeed, love making up games with rules. In my experience, actually, young children go through a particularly exciting phase when they spend most of the time talking about the rules and relatively li little time actually playing the game. Um, but absolutely love it. And, of course, you know, learning the rules of society, the rules of behaviour, the rules of, of how um, human society works and so on, is a key thing, you know, this is one of the many things ch young children are very enthusiastic to learn. So that sort of sketches out for you, in a way, the sort of problems, what we know so far a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on this afternoon. I just wanted to introduce to you uh, the team so far. We're hoping, of course, in a few years' time, this will be uh, a bigger team and hopefully a, a very powerful team of researchers. I'm happy to say that play is a really resurgent area of interest, an area of, of research. And today, of course, we're celebrating a developed relationship between um, the, the Pedal Research Group and the Faculty of Education and the University with the LEGO Company and the LEGO Foundation. And we're thrilled to have some representatives from that uh, uh, organization um, with us today. Many of you will have played with LEGO as children, and it's made you the people you are today, in my, <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> or at least in part, I hope. Um, but we're very privileged and proud to be working with a company that believes so strongly in doing uh, the best uh, that they possibly can for children. And I think that's all of our joint um, ambitions. Um, so Jenny and Ellie and Marisol and Sarah and Audrey will be talking to you later about the particular parts of this that they're going to embark on researching in a serious and rigorous way uh, as we go on. Um, and that, I believe, is the end of my introduction. So we'll speak later. And now we're delighted, I hope, <laughs> uh, that uh, Hannah Rams Rasmussen can join us on the stage and have a few words to say. Um, I have to get your things working. Sorry, so done. Hannah is the Chief Executive Officer of the LEGO Foundation and has been working basically for the benefit of children for many, many years. And we're delighted to have you here to talk to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, David, for, for this uh, starting introduction to, to uh, the barriers for, for play in the world. Um, so it's, it, first of all, it's a real honor to be here. It's been an exciting day. We've been uh, running around to see as much as possible of the work done in different colleges and institutions in, in Cambridge. And it's been fascinating. So uh, it's with a bit of an off we are, we are here and also that, uh, that we are engaging into the, uh, say, uh, further manifestation of the cooperation between uh, this uh, pedal uh, entity and uh, the LEGO Foundation. So let me just start up by um, telling you a little bit about the, the LEGO Foundation that uh, probably many of you haven't uh, met before. Let's see. Yes, it works. So in the LEGO Foundation, uh, we believe uh, that our aim is to make children's lives and thereby communities better. We are aiming at building a future where le learning through play empowers children to become creative, lifelong learners. We do this by making sure that fundamental, the fundamental values of play is understood, embraced, and acted upon. So what does that really mean? Well, we believe that children are, the role mo are our role models because of their natural hands-on, minds-on approach to learning. Children are curious, creative, and imaginative. What we saw today in the, primary, uh, the Cambridge Primary School was that the minute that learning through play or playfulness engaged into the equation, the children's ability to stay focused and really engage with what they are doing 
the time they can spend just grows tremendously because they are intrinsically motivated to continue their activity and the playfulness. So children embrace and discover and wonder. They are natural intuitive learners that learn and experience the world through play. These are qualities that we should nurture and stimulate through life. So the foundation's focus is really on the zero to 12 year olds with a specific focus on the, on the younger age group from the age of zero to six years old. And that is why, as I'm sure that uh, uh, some of the speakers later today will also tell you a bit about, that's because of course that's where the child develops the most and the fastest, both mentally and physically. Do I go through to the end of, uh, to the back? Yes, good. Um, the Lego Foundation, we are promoting systemic scalable change in partnership with others. So the partnership part is very important for us in order to be able to transform attitudes and behaviors to learning through play. We believe that three things need to come together to achieve this. We really need evidence, evidence to speak to people who ask, how do I know that this really works? In this context, the foundation is establishing a research network on global knowledge or a global knowledge center where researchers, universities and others develop and share applicable knowledge uh, relating to play, learning and creativity. And this is exactly where also the partnership with, with Cambridge is so fundamental to us. We need programs and models to speak to people who say, but what should I do? Show me that it works. And finally, we need the buy-in to do the advocacy, to reach more people and to get them to change behaviors because that's how really change happens. Knowledge is one thing and believing is one thing, but doing is really what makes the difference in the end. So doing advocacy, building buy-in through the knowledge, that is really the wheel the whole foundation activity is turning or the, the, the wheel that we hope to make spin faster in the foundation. Walking around campus today, not one campus I must say, but quite a few, uh, made me realize how much the University of Cambridge and the Lego Foundation, the Lego, the Lego entity has in common. The examples are quite tangible. We've seen uh, at the primary school today some of the same dynamics we have in a small school in Billund, the international school in Billund, who are also working through the pedagogy of play to build a pedagogy of play for children there. Um, I also learned that undergraduate engineering students are, are working with, uh, with uh, Mindstorm's uh, Lego course in the first few weeks of their tenure, which was quite impressive. We got to see some of their models and it was uh, impressive what they got out of their Lego kits. And then we also have experienced this, um, say, I can see one of the teachers from the primary school up there on the, on the back row and uh, I was amazed to see how he managed to keep 20 plus young, young children engaged by, in, by taking them seriously, being at the same eye level as, as them and really, really engaging them in the activity. It was about grammar. I, I haven't seen a class being that attentive in a, in a situation around grammar before. So that energy, that drive and that passion to really make a difference for the children you are around, that I feel I was sitting with the vice chancellor at, at lunch, had the privilege and he had it. And, and all we meet here really seem to have that energy. That is fantastic. I see a shared sense of curiosity and uh, providing opportunities for children and students to push their boundaries. And uh, one of it was that, that actually uh, a young student uh, was involved in restoring a 3,000 year old mummy here at the Fitzwilliams uh, Museum to allowing a, a young person still under education to really engage in such a project show, so, uh, say, uh, cross-boundary uh, cooperation and a lot of uh, courage also, I say. Even we were allowed close to this case, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and all of this, this uh, curiosity and being ready to move across boundaries, that's really amazing and extraordinary in the world we are living in today. Because what we see when we look at the picture for education today is that things are moving very, very slowly. 
we also see that there's a lot of focus of preparing children to do tests, to be, do tests with predetermined answers. And um, we see this approach to learning as counterproductive. It means that if we really want our children to strive and become lifelong learners, we need to have much more open-ended questions and approaches. We need to play in education, in learning and in development. At the LEGO Foundation, we believe that the ability to think and to act creatively is much more important now than ever. And why? That is, of course, because things are changing at such a high speed that what you learned yesterday of facts is not potentially very relevant tomorrow. But the ability to develop new solutions is crucial. The University of, Cam the University of Cambridge just finalized a very exciting research project. Uh, David was just uh, Professor Whitebread, I should say, when we are here. Sorry for that. Um, um, just finalized and you told more about it and I know we will also touch upon it again so I won't spend much time on this but this project really show how important playful experiences are for children for their learning and, and uh, development and also for areas like uh, writing and uh, languages. We talked to some of the young children this morning who had been building models and they could actually walk us through their history that they wanted to show their books so they were quite proud of the stories they made in a few hours session yesterday. Um, but before we hear uh, Dr. Whitebread talk more about this project, I would like to invite you to create a story with me. Uh, let's say it's a little bit more strict than what we allowed the small children to do yesterday, but I'm sure we will still manage and uh, go through this exercise. And the bricks did disappear, so maybe I can borrow a set from somewhere. Ah, thank you, Louis. They were put up here, but uh, apparently some playful person took them and uh, started <laughs> using them. Um, but what you should do is you should make sure you have your six bricks and then they are actually different colors. Quite often, if we hand those out too often, it becomes chaos because you don't have the right ones, but I, I'm, I'm assuming you have them. And uh, so what we will do is um, for different elements of the, of the story, I will add a brick to form a tower. You decide what the tower, how the tower exactly is built. I also ask you to follow me and build this, not the same tower, but at least in the same uh, color, uh, row of order for the colors. And when I stop, it's up to you to finish the story by adding the last two bricks and the last part of your story for each brick to your tower. So, our story begins in 2010 when British researchers Okay, I'm supposed to do like this because then we get the right picture, yes. British researchers and a Danish foundation <laughs> found that they shared a cause. They wanted to make it known to the world that play is not only full of fun and joy. It sets the foundation for our ability to think and reflect. Yes, a little bit different. So, are you with me so far? That was the wrong time to ask. But uh, are you trying to hold up your models? Does it, the, the colors, you got some different, yes, very nice. So thank you very much. So now, what you should do is you should use the last two bricks. Maybe you enter your part of the story, you tell it to the person next to you, and they will share with you their ideas of this story development. This could be a crocodile coming into the, to the auditorium. Could also be other things, fully up to you. So please take a few minutes to finalize the stories together using the last two colors and the last two bricks, adding them to your tower.
so I can see that probably you can go on for a long time telling each other's stories. And now I think what, what we would like to show you now, I think we are getting back into the room. You know, you, you are doing exactly the same as, as young children. You stay engaged and focused on that task instead of... Uh, that's, that's great. And that's exactly what it's all about. So what you have been experiencing is how you develop your narrative skills through play. Instead of a blank paper scenario, you, you th your thinking is connected to a physical object. In this case, not, you don't have too much to work with, only the color. And still, it sends your imagination running in a certain direction, and, and you have different connotations around the colors that actually gives you a platform to discuss ideas on how the story should develop. So that in itself is pretty amazing. What the children are doing was also, of course, working with different figures and models and, 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 and more, say, uh, figurative ways of uh, developing their stories. So when you were offered this, uh, constructing in the world, constructing things in the world is really about constructing new ideas. And in this sense, uh, thinking, learning, tinkering are inseparable. So we are supporting this new centre at the University of Cambridge because we believe that children need to start learning the way we want them to continue as creative, engaged, lifelong learners. Learning through play is the way in which children do this naturally. And this new centre is about raising standards by understanding and applying new knowledge to help children learn in school, in university and throughout life. So thank you very much for engaging in this small activity and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We had lots of fun. We built aeroplanes with ours, so I don't know what everybody else built, but good. So um, I'm delighted that our next speaker, although sadly she can't be with us uh, in person, is going to come across on the video. It's uh, Professor Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, who is uh, a world-leading researcher on the topic of play. And we're delighted that she's agreed to join PEDAL's advisory uh, group. So we have her guiding some of our projects, which is fantastic. And she sent a video for us to watch. Hello, Cambridge. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you today for the opening of the Play in Education Development and Learning Center. What an exciting adventure we are all going to have as we start to study the way play and learning can work together. For too many years, play and learning have been divorced. People don't seem to understand that play is not just a four-letter word, but that nested in play is the richest learning that brings together active, engaged learning that's meaningful and socially interactive. And that's the way human minds work. Why did we divorce play and learning in the first place? Well, I think somehow we worried about falling farther and farther behind in those test scores, thinking that we had to shove content into the empty minds of a child. But nothing could be further from the truth, because in the playgrounds and in the sandboxes, we know that children develop precisely the set of skills that I call the six C's that are going to be critical for success in the future learning how to collaborate and get along, that social-emotional learning that forms the foundation for how we will learn in the future. The communication skills. We know that young children talk more when they're playing than they do when they're not. The content, the learning about physics, the learning about social studies, the learning about math mathematics through block play, all of that comes in playful environments. The critical thinking of sifting through mountains of information so that we can find just what's important. The creative innovation or putting things together in new ways. And of course, the confidence to build that tower just a little bit taller and to watch it as it falls down. Because even failure 
has lessons for how to have greater success. There have been numbers of studies that have shown the value of playful learning, or what we might call plurning. But we don't have enough of those rigorous studies yet. We know that young children, when we just teach them through direct instruction, they memorize what we teach them, but they don't explore all the facets of what a toy can do or how a box can open. We know that when we're trying to teach spatial skills in one of our own studies, like what is a triangle, that young children learn better in guided play, where we help them see the similarities between fat triangles and thin triangles, even triangles that are lopsided, and those that aren't triangles and don't have three sides and three angles. They learn it through guided play better than they would through either free play or direct instruction when we just tell them what to notice. In study after study, in fact, in Alfieri's meta-analysis of 164 studies, we find that discovery learning, that playful learning, is optimal. It shows up in tools of the mind for social regulation and executive function skills, flexibility, memory, and planning. We learn it through play. So play needs to become a part of our education, a part of what goes on in classrooms and what seeps beyond the classroom into the world at large. We need more time for play. We need to reinstitute, recess. Children learn through play. And as Carla Rinaldi said, play and learning, well, they go together. They are like the wings of a butterfly. On the one wing, we have play. On the other, we have learning. And together, they allow the butterfly to fly away. Thanks for creating this institute. Lego, thank you for the support. I wish I could be there today. And I know we're going to do great things together. I'm sure you'll all agree that that was not only inspiring, but a call for arms for the work that Pedal's going to do over the next few years. So thank you. David, you were going to I've say a few words. I've got this picture in my head now of a butterfly going round and round mm. in circles. I've got one, <laughs> one wing, wing, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, what we're hoping to show you now um, is, an, is a, a movie um, made for us, well, funded, um, made for made by an independent Danish film company, but funded by the Lego Foundation, which is a film about a project that Marisol and myself are involved in over the last two or three years with th three local primary schools, looking at uh, playful introductions to writing. Um, many of you will know, if you work with young children, that for many young children, learning to write is an enormously complex uh, skill, a very important skill in today's society to be able to write uh, a, you know, a clear argument or write a clear report or write an exciting story, or whatever it is. But many young children suffer, uh, struggle with this. And so we've been carrying out a study called the PLANS Project, Play, Learning and Narrative Skills, over the last two or three years with, with local schools. And this is a, a movie about, about what happened, um, we okay. hope. So basically, Abby, this yeah. is what's going to happen. So they're going to be standing like this. Yeah, and they ask him, who are you? And then he says, I'm your father. And then he says, but you are dead. There's a common misconception uh, I think in the everyday world that play is something that children do, it's a stage they go through, uh, it's quite fun, we let them do it, it doesn't serve any particular purpose and they grow out of it. There is a huge problem in primary education in supporting children to become uh, able and effective writers. So we were trying out and finding out whether a playful approach could help children in the writing. 
and we're using Lego as an educational resource for children to represent their ideas. Lego helps me see the creativity in my brain, mm -hmm. so when we're writing it really helps me get the effect in my brain. So we had some previous research showing that this was a promising approach, but we didn't know how it would work in the classroom. We work with the teachers as co-researchers, and I mean that quite seriously, because we know the research, but they know how to teach. They, better than anybody else, can see the difference that this intervention was making. Before I was involved in this, I found that my English lessons, there was a big pressure to get onto writing as fast as possible. And it meant that often children would come out afterwards with very uninspired ideas. Today, for our English lesson, we are going to be finishing the story of the Hero Twins. I'd like you to write the opening to your story. Make sure that as you do so, you're using your model. Move things around to help you to get ideas for your writing. We've been using this book to tell a story. With the Lego, the children have been recreating the story in storyboard form, using the individual flats. This is the ending to get back home. And then what, when one of them dies, king. king. The other one has to find the transport to get back home and it's a bike. When you get to a different part of the story, you can change the scene very quickly in front of you to move the characters around in the scene. It's one of the great things about it as opposed to a paper plan. If, like, Hunter did survive, would, like, his father come home? Yeah. A key part of our research is going into the schools to observe what children actually do in the small groups when they're working together. We measured their metacognitive abilities, we measured their basic language. We've also taken measures of the children's fundamental oral narrative skills, so how good are they at telling a story. So I was pleased to be taking part in the research project but really struggled to begin with. I thought it would be an exciting, exhilarating, positive experience. It couldn't have been further from that. It was just a, it was a horrible, horrible disaster. The role of the teacher has to change some, somewhat because they no longer become you know, the fountain of knowledge and the instructor. Ideally, they become co-players. What started to work was just literally trial and error, a lot of trial and error. And then he falls off again. <laughs> I like building and uh -huh. then sort of writing down and changing it because yeah. if you get stuck, mm -hmm. then you like, can, you can look at up. the picture and the Lego and sort of say, ah, oh, wait, we need to describe that more mm. because of blah, blah, blah. When they do their writing, they want to do that model justice. They want to add as the detail in the writing that they've added to their model. Let's look at the bit where, where David's just left. But at the moment, what we're doing is we're, we're doing what's called behavioral coding. It will enable us to detect patterns in the behavior. We know that children have improved in their uh, levels of creative fluency, their levels of metacognition, the standard of their writing, their ability to collaborate. But what is very clear is, is that the children who have benefited most from this project are the ones who started out as the least able writers. The main point is engagement and fun. Children like it. If you make anything more motivating and more engaging, then clearly that's going to help.
So my next research project is going to start with Lego. I think this will improve my creativity no end. But um, we're now going to have uh, a panel discussion with members of our research centre coming up to sort of give some insight into the research programme that they're designing. Um, and then there'll be time for questions and answers from the uh, panel afterwards. Thanks. I just wanted to say that you recognise several film careers have been... This is, you saw them here first, OK? okay. So I think we're going to start by asking Jenny the difficult question of the day. Uh, Jenny, can you tell us what is play? So, <laughs> I'll get the easy question. Um, we're research researching around this topic, what is play? And of course, this has been the subject of human inquiry for centuries, and you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to try and summarise all that research here. Um, but some of the traditions um, that have informed our thinking are, um, for example, the research into animal behaviour and ethology, um, where people have thought about what are the characteristics of play? So they... Um, for example, Gordon Burghardt's research, do I need to speak up a bit, um, has told us that play seems to be not immediately adaptive in an e evolutionary context, so it's not something that fulfills an immediate need, um, for example, like food. It occurs when we're in a non-stressed state, but we're relatively alert. Um, and it's fun, it's rewarding, there's something intrinsically motivating about it, but it's not serious, it's not a serious activity. So we might contrast play fighting to real fighting, for example. Um, other approaches to play that have been very useful are kind of taxonomical approaches, but of course, what happens there is that, um, as psychologists, we always like to contradict one another, and if somebody sets up a taxonomy of play, for example, these sort of five types of play, we discussed earlier, someone will always come up with an example that contradicts it. Yeah. So, they better not. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're about in Strand Day really is um, developing um, a theory of play within a developmental psychology model. Um, that means from we're moving from concepts and this kind of slippery idea of play and trying to define constructs. That means things that we can actually measure, we can make hypotheses, we can test those hypotheses and then we can refine them. So one of the important um, things we will be doing is working on measurements of play, looking at how we can accurately, reliably, and meaningful me meaningfully measure play. Thanks, Jane. And then you're working on that strategy. Do you want to tell us how you plan to investigate? Yes. So as Jenny said, that play as a construct is definitionally ambiguous. And the knock-on effect of that for the research is that there's a whole range of different measures of play that all purport to measure sophistication or frequency of children's play. But it makes it really difficult when we try and consolidate the literature to understand what's going on because the measures are so diverse. So what we plan on doing is we're proposing a multi-measure, multi-informant approach. So we're trying to really triangulate play by getting at it using different assessments and different raters. And at the outset of this project, we're really going to start to constrain the types of play we're looking at, first of all. So as David said in his opening address, that there are these a number of different types of play. In this uh, strand, we're going to look firstly at just pretend play. And that's because it's been the most commonly assessed within a psychological framework. But the methods that we're proposing can then be applied more broadly to other types of play, such as rough and tumble play or object play. So there's three key ways we're proposing to measure play. And the first one is just to watch what children do when they're playing with each other. So simply observe children's play interactions and then do detailed behavioural codings of these interactions. So things such as nominal action, joint proposals and amity and really get at the nitty gritty of these sort of interactions between children's play. And for me as a bit of a stats nerd, what's really exciting about this <laughs> is we can do some analyses that tell us whether these behaviours all hang together under an overarching idea of play or whether play might be best understood as a constellation of independent behaviours. And this may go some way for us to understand what play is and then move forward and more confidently, empirically examine play in childhood. The second and third way we're going to measure play is using children themselves. So children are the ones that are playing, so why don't we ask them about their play? And this is actually not being done very frequently in the literature. We normally talk to parents and teachers about children's play. So we're going to ask children themselves how they perceive themselves as playful, because we know that children are able to report on their own self-concept and their self-perceptions. And we're also going to ask children's classmates to report on their peers' play behaviour. So we're getting at play from different angles. 
And together, by observing children's play, by asking children about their self-perceptions of themselves as playful, and getting their peers to report on their play behaviour, we can go some way to developing our understanding of what play is, how we can measure play in childhood, and use this to then examine more confidently how play fits into development in childhood. Thanks, Ellen. So, so far we've been talking about play in the early years. David, how does play develop as children age? Um, right, another easy question. <laughs> um, uh, as, you've, as we've tried to represent a little bit so far, in the seminar, there is actually quite a lot of uh, research that's been done on play. Um, some of it rather fluffy though, some of it not particularly scientific. And the, and the really good scientific research that has been done has either simply produced a kind of good description of the kind of play you might see, uh, you know, at typical ages and so on and so forth, through, through development, um, or ha has uh, uh, produced evidence about associations, you know, that play seems to go with this, or this seems to happen and then children are playful, or children are playful and then something happens. But what we don't understand from these, you know, cross-sectional studies or merely descriptive studies is really what are the mechanisms underlying all this? What's happening in the brain when, uh, when children are playing? What, what developments are occurring as we talked about changes in I talked earlier about changes in the mouse brain, what's happening in the human brain. Um, and uh, in particular, we don't really understand, you know, what, you might, what might be the causal relationships. We don't understand, well, if play is influencing learning or is influencing well-being, what are the mechanisms through which that's happening? And that's very difficult to do with, um, you know, short-term cross-sectional um, studies of the kind we've got. We, we also have a very patchy knowledge about play. It tends to be associated with children and really children between particular ages. Most of the research on play is really with children in what you might call um, not right at the beginning of childhood, you know, not, not, not babies such as Solomon who we have met earlier, but um, you know, round up from the ages of say three to seven, there's quite a lot of work describing the types of play and what children do. But even just as a basic description, we don't really know what happens in those very early years. And we certainly don't know much about play in adolescence or play in adulthood in any systematic way. We sort of um, you know, know a little about it. Um, so what, what we, what we um, you know, need to try to achieve is a much more holistic idea of, of development. And the other thing that's not happened is play has tended to be researched as sort of its separate little silo. So there's a play literature, but, but all these other things we know about development, the development of metacognitive abilities, the development of language, the development of memory abilities, and so on, there's very little research saying, well, hang on, how does play, if play develops, how does the development of play relate to these things? So really quite fundamental questions about how does it relate to these other cognitive uh, abilities? How do they impact upon it? What kind of environmental influences are there that might impact on play? So why are some children more playful than others? And what are the, what are the outcomes that are determined by play? Um, you know, if, if you are playful as a four or five year old, is that really what's causing you to be, you know, to get to Cambridge University and be a wonderfully creative problem solver? Or is it something else? So quite a lot of, work to do, but interesting, interesting <laughs> stuff. Well, David also talked about the difficulty of methods, so what methods are you proposing to use, Marisa? Um, so in our research strand, the main goal is to establish a new longitudinal study to understand the development of children's play, um, to, to answer some of the important questions that David was, was mentioning. So um, if we really want to get it right and make a substantial contribution in this area with educational implications, um, there is some groundwork very important that we need to do beforehand. So, for example, we need to review systematically what has been done before so that we can build upon that work. We need to understand what measures we can use to track developmentally the changes of children's play um, across childhood. So in this case, for instance, we're going to be collaborating with Jenny and Elian uh, in the measures that they develop. Um, we also need to consider the scale of of the study we want to we want to do, the resources, the time frames um, of 
uh, the program of data collection to observe children's play in different points uh, of their life. So, in the first instance, we're going to conduct what is called a feasibility study, and this is going to really help us to determine the parameters um, for our new uh, longitudinal uh, research. Um, but we do have a strategy in place to start addressing these issues straight away by looking at uh, data that already exists about children's lives and their opportunities to play. So we're quite fortunate in the UK that the Economic and Social Research Council, as well as the Medical Research Council, have invested a lot of money to put in place longitudinal studies of the British population. So one of these studies in particular, the Millennium Cohort Study, um, it's a very big effort to understand the development of children um, in the UK. It's a study that involves over 18,000 children and they've observed their cognitive development with skills including self-regulation, um, language, um, several, several measures that they've collected in this, in this study. And we're going to look at this uh, particular um, data set trying to understand how do early learning abilities as well as opportunities to play impact on children's school readiness and educational attainment later in their, in their lives. So we think that our analysis of this study is going to make an important contribution on its own, but it's also going to help us to establish the specific developmental model and hypothesis that we want to consider in, in our new study. Well, thank you, Marisol. Sarah, <laughs> I think you were going to talk to about us about playful learning and can it actually make a contribution in school? We saw in the video that we think it can. What's your view on that? Well, thank you. Um, so I should say, first of all, that Audrey and I have just started working on this strand. Audrey joined us in September, so we can tell you a little bit about um, the thoughts we've started to have and some plans that we're still in the process of making. Really what our, our project is about is the role of the child in their own learning. For a long time, people had a perception of children as blank slates or empty vessels that you could just pour knowledge into or uh, imprint onto. And actually what we know now from quite a lot of research in developmental psychology is that that's not really how children learn. So that means that the way we teach children needs to reflect that. And we think that play is a very good opportunity or context for learning because it reflects the way children learn naturally, which is through exploration and discovery and self-guided self um, self activities. So what we, what we don't really know enough about yet, although there are lots and lots of examples, including the one we saw earlier in the, in the film, there are lots of examples of um, teachers and parents around the world using play to support their children in, in learning. What we don't know really is exactly why it works that way. What is the mechanism? What are the, what are the cognitive mechanisms that the child brings? And what are the, um, for example, the types of questions that parents and teachers use that are having an effect on their learning? So what we plan to do is to look at teachers' intuitions, things that teachers are already doing around the world, take that and combine it with what we know from the research in cognitive developmental psychology about how children learn, and develop some theory-driven approaches to, to teaching and to be able to test those rigorously and empirically um, through, through our studies. So I think we're well-placed to do this because, as I said, we're both cognitive psychologists. We'll be working closely with teachers. Audrey can say a bit more about what we're actually planning to do. And in the long run, if we do find specific ways that are, that are supporting children's learning through play, then that can hopefully be used in lots and lots of different contexts. So we're, we're very ambitious, even though we're just starting. That's good. Ambition to change the world. That's yep. what we want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Audrey, you were going to tell us a little bit more about the, sp the specific project. Yes, thank you for the question. So over the next three years, we want to be developing um, playful pedagogical approaches that are theory driven. And so at the heart of our approach is a commitment to working with teachers as co-researchers. And this is because we believe that teachers' experience from classroom learning is incredibly valuable. They want to uh, work alongside teachers to do this. And so our goal is really to see how playful exploration activities can shape and might shape children's active learning skills in reception and year one classrooms. So for people who don't know those terms, four to five, five to six year olds. 
And so, for instance, one question, how do hints that, that you know, teachers might give or questions that they might ask make, might make children into more innovative problem solvers? So the project will sort of get place in four phases. In the first observation and planning phase, we'll be trying to get a sense of what do teachers do and think that develops act, children's active learning right now? And how does then that compare with studies in the research literature that are carefully controlled? Then when we have a sense, we have that groundwork, we're going to enter a development phase where we work together with teachers to develop new pedagogical approaches. And we'll need to, of course, test and refine and test and refine these to make sure that they're you know, usable by everyone and that teachers and schools and parents like them and children. <laughs> And so and then another, um, after we do all that and it's ready to go, we'll be working with a larger group of schools in an evaluation phase. And the goal of this is to see how these pedagogical approaches impact children's learning motivation. And we'll be using scientific methods in this. So we'll be, for instance, using third parties to randomly assign conditions. We'll also be as, um, getting some process evaluation. So how are teachers actually using these approaches in their classrooms to get a kind of why they might be working or not working. And then finally we'll enter a dissemination phase where we'll be working together with other organizations to make sure that our pedagogical approaches can be used by schools around the world. So that brings me to um, one of our key goals, actually we have three sort of key goals throughout this project. One is for it to be internationally relevant. So we want to make sure we're focusing on active learning skills that are valued by, in countries around the world. And then another key goal is that we want to understand how specific learning activities and techniques might develop specific active learning skills of children. And this is really important because it will help us to move beyond just producing sort of a product that schools can use and to try to evaluate and sort of select other educational programs. Um, so that's what we're hoping to do. And then our third key goal is to, in all of this work, to be partnering with this larger network of LEGO Foundation partners whom we're very lucky to be a part of. And so we look forward to doing this and to try to make our work as successful as it can be. Fantastic, good, good insight into the program. Andrew, before we open up to the floor, are there some reflections you'd like to make on, on the research program and its goals? Yes, let me do that. So, um my role is to head up research and learning for the Lego Foundation and I suppose understandably people ask, well, why, why is the Lego Foundation interested in all of that? What, what's it about? And I, I don't know about you, but I, I came through uh, Cambridge Railway Station yesterday and there was a poster on the wall. You, you probably all ignore it because you see it every day and I, I read it and it said students come here and make a difference in Cambridge. They leave here and make a difference in the world. And um, it, it struck me that that's actually the point of intersection here where, where the Lego Foundation is interested is taking this knowledge and actually making a difference in the world with it. And, and that's why within the foundation, we're not acad academics or experts in this field, but we have the privilege of working with some of the best experts and some of the best people right the way around the world to do that, to make that difference in the world. Um, I just want to give you one really concrete example of a difference we want to make. And I, and I could have chosen a dozen different examples from across our programs and our portfolios, but it, it's one that I saw personally about a year ago um, we're doing a lot of work in South Africa, where we're working in township schools. Uh, we've been working for some years now just north of Johannesburg in a township called Ashtville. And we're working in uh, government-funded schools with children who, of course, are experiencing all the difficulties of modern-day South Africa, which uh, means that most of them are living without uh, uh, parents because of the consequences of AIDS and the consequences of a, a very mobile population. Uh, they're in classrooms of 50 children um, because, frankly, that's what the budget can afford. Um, and they're in anything but the kind of ideal um, scenario or situation that relatively we would be enjoying here in the UK or in Cambridge. Um, and, you know, the good news in somewhere like South Africa is that the, the government has fully bought into the importance of early years education. It's investing a lot of money into it. And as a consequence of that, they've introduced a new reception grade for, for all children right the way across the country. It's fabulous news. Except that when you actually look at the reality of what those children are doing, they're really just being brought into school a year earlier to do the worst of primary education just a year earlier. So um, I've walked into those rooms and I've seen children sitting there bored. Uh, bored to a point where they're no longer engaging with others. The, the, the ability to see anything in their eyes has, has disappeared. Um, if they are learning anything, they're learning that there is one right answer to a question that their teacher asks them, and it's their job to regurgitate it in a test. 
Um, this, this is the hard reality of some of the situations we're seeing out there, and it's those kinds of situations um, that we really want to change. You know, one of the benefits that the Foundation has got is that we find it relatively straightforward to, we find doors open to us when we'd like to speak to ministers and civil servants and others that can influence this, but they often sit there with pretty much the same questions. They want to know, how do you measure this? Does it, does it work? What does it look like? Can I, can I develop it while, while these children are at school? Does it actually make a difference? You say that play makes a difference, but does it really make a difference five or ten years later? Um, how do I actually make this happen in this kindergarten with this particular teacher who hasn't really been properly trained and lacks confidence and so on? These are the hard-hitting realities out there, and the questions that the panel has just been talking about are exactly the knowledge and the evidence and the research we need to build up if we're actually going to be able to answer those questions and if we're going to see these things change in the world. And that, for me, is why there's, there's a huge, huge challenge behind this. Let me finish just by bringing it right here to home because we had a fabulous trip to the, uh, the Cambridge Primary School this morning. We saw engaged children, uh, the, the exact opposite of, of perhaps what I've just described to you. Um, and, and for me, it was a great reminder that when you get children engaged, when they begin to learn that there isn't just one right answer to a question, but actually the second answer is even more interesting and sometimes failing altogether, um, and trying again is, a, is an even more interesting route. Um, I think amazing things start to happen in the way children are learning, the way they engage and so on. Um, I, you know, the thing that really came home to me today is that those children we were seeing this morning are going to be the undergraduates in this university and other universities across this country um, in just 10 years' time. And I think there's a real importance here to get an agenda like this moving so that we have coming into higher education, both here in the UK and elsewhere, students who really are creative, engaged, lifelong learners that universities like this aspire to. Thank you. Thank you. This is the fun bit. This is the bit I've been waiting for all day because I gather we have some microphones somewhere. I hope. Some, we've got some. It's on the side of we've the got thing. some helpers. And we are going to take questions from the floor. The microphones are unusual. Apparently, you can throw them. She's got a question. <laughs> Go on then. She's got a question. Up there. Okay. But you do have to catch them though. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you very much for some really interesting presentations. Um, one question I had to ask, it was really nice to get an insight into the different research strands that you're going to kind of develop over the next few years. Are there any plans to introduce learning through play mechanisms for the teacher training that takes place in the Faculty of Education here in Cambridge, both for primary and for the PGC courses and things like that? Because I guess one of the problems will be, it's, it's really great doing this research, but of course there's teachers being qualified all over the country, and what kind of, what kind of training are they receiving? Because obviously, it's, as you really mentioned, it's this um, directed play was quite important as well, not just free play and all that kind of thing. So are there, are there ways in kind of happening now, what happens you know, for, for teacher training at the moment? Can I just point out that we have the two leaders of teacher training in the faculty, in the audience. So can you throw the yeah, microphone right. over to Jane? Yeah. Okay, let's hear from them. <laughs> well caught. Hello, everyone. Um, you have I'm to hold Jane. it the right way up. Yeah, is that okay? <laughs> I'm Jane Warwick. I'm the earliest uh, primary PGC course manager at the Faculty of Education. My colleague Mary Ann Walpert um, also works with me on the course, as does Helen Bradford or previously and Harriet Rose. Um, and we are very much sort of in the spirit of play, sort of see that as a, a, an important tenet in all the courses um, that we run with our PGCs. So during the very first week this year, um, all our trainees, whether they're going to teach seven-year-olds, four-year-olds, 11-year-olds, they had um, a session um, talking about the importance of play. 
and we realised that actually we've got to raise the profile of this because of what, to sort of counter some of the things that the trainees see in school, and that if they have that understanding of the importance of pay right from day one of being here with us in the faculty, hopefully that will influence their understanding of early years pedagogy and sort of pedagogy foot through the primary ages. And so we were surprised actually for because all trainees, no matter which age they were going to teach, responded so fantastically to this that they, um, they're they taking that already, although they've been with us only for six weeks. Um, they, they really sort of grasp the importance of that and I think it's instilled in them the value of play. Um, and I think that we, what we want to do is try to work with the team to develop ways in which we can support our partnership schools. Um, we've got um, Harriet here from Homerton Children's Centre. All our trainees have been out to visit, all our early primary trainees have been out to visit that setting only yesterday to see that happening in practice. So they can see, they hear from us the theoretical frameworks, but then they see it working in practice to give them the confidence to take it into their own settings. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else wanted to add anything. Harriet, do you want to add anything? some more questions as well? So that we can, there's a question at the back. We might collect questions so that everybody gets a chance. Thank you. This is great. Um, uh, my name is Tim Gill. I'm, I guess I come under the category of play advocate from, from David's... Um, is that... Trying, oh, that's better. Um, that category. I want to ask about... If we talk to children themselves, children in primary, children in the schools that, that you visited here in Cambridge, about what they mean by play, they would talk about play time. They would talk about you know break time. Um, and, and I'm just reflecting on Kathy, Kathy Hirsch Pasek's remark about the divorce between play and learning. It seems to me you you, you know you've, you you couldn't find a better example of that divorce um, than the default attitude of schools to play and break times. So what plans does the centre have to look specifically at, at break and play times in schools and, and what's going on for children during that most playful, hopefully most playful time of their school lives? Okay, I think this is a question for me. Um, <laughs> okay. Sorry, do you want to pass the microphone to the front to yeah. stop the feedback? That would be brilliant. Can you chuck it to, um, to Sarah? So play times are a particular research interest of mine. I've long been interested in this context that's free in the middle of the school day where children get to play, they get to interact, where it's relatively unsupervised. So um, the kind of scaffolding that adults might provide for um, children in that context um, is perhaps a little bit lower than you might see in the classroom. So children have to up their game a little bit. They have to um, really pull out um, enhanced cognitive skills out of the bag. They have to um, bring their social skills to the fore. Um, so I actually did my PhD on children's playtimes and looking at what um, social behaviours in the playground um, look like, what they can tell us about children's development. And I'm quite excited to be working on a new ESRC funded grant with um, Prof Steve Hales, who's over here in the audience. We're actually going to be using GPS tracking and other motion sensors to really get a sense of the dynamics of the school playground. So we're hoping to be able to look at children's individual differences um, as measured by kind of more traditional means and look at how that maps dynamically into the playground environment. We're also working with a charity called Learning Through Landscapes in this project and <coughs> Prof David Skews at UCL. Um, and we're, we're just very excited to be at the beginning of that. We're going to be thinking about the effects of the environment as well as the individual social differences. So it is very much something that's high up, certainly my agenda and I think the peddle agenda too. Yes. A question here. Yeah. Thank you. I think I've, I've got the background. Um, it's Wendy Elliott from the Safe Childhood Movement. Um, first, I want to say I think this is just a fantastic initiative. Thank you, the Lego Foundation, because we really need this kind of initiative globally, certainly in the England and the UK, but globally, so that we can start providing policymakers with the kind of evidence that make them understand or help them to understand why we get so passionate about these things. And sometimes it's very difficult to bridge the language um, to help policymakers understand. But, but I wanted to specifically talk about um, this idea about, and Andrew briefly mentioned it, how quickly children are turned off. When I, I, many years ago, as part of a master's degree, I did a small piece of research, and I'd love to see this extended, on children's understanding of work and play. And actually, we interviewed 
lots of children at preschool and nursery about how they understood that. And what was fascinating at that time, that they didn't see any difference at all, that Danny went to work at the office and they went to work at nursery. They, the, for them, there was no division. But the shocking thing, uh, which is, I, it really shocked me at the time, was that within six months of entering the formal school system, work was something that was associated with something that was given to you by someone else, and that was particularly associated with pens and pa or paints and paper. And play was something that you did when you'd finished your work, and that already had a diminished value, that you were allowed out to play because you'd finished your work. And I found it shocking at the time what a, how immensely fast that had happened. So one of the things that um, I would love to see is a, 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 for, to actually talk to children about their experience of those words during these very essentially essential kind of transition moments. So um, because this shift in how they perceive themselves, how they perceive playful learning and the value of um, what tasks have, have value and worth and what tasks don't, I think is a really interesting area. So I'm absolutely delighted to have the centre get engaged in these questions. Thank you. Could you just pass the microphone behind you? Uh, um, hi, my name is Robert Palmer. I'm from the Queen Mining Foundation in Jordan. Um, this is a question, well, the first question to Sarah and Audrey. You mentioned about looking at what teachers are already doing um, around the world. Um, can you tell us more about where you're thinking about looking at and are any of those countries in the Arab states? Um, and second question is, are there any plans to look at um, play and learning in non-formal settings through, for example, children's museums? We have a children's museum in Jordan and a big problem with trying to communicate the aspect of play and learning to the general public. Where shall I throw this? Sarah. I can, I can start. That's right. That's right. So, um, so, Sarah, you're standing up next to you. Thanks. So, um, you raise a really interesting point about inform informal learning contexts. And actually, when I started to think about doing this project, I kind of, part of me thought, you know what, it would be a lot easier to just forget about schools <laughs> and go into museums and go into other kinds of informal learning contexts where they just, traditionally lend themselves more to learning through play. That's, that's a lot of what they do. Um, but I think because of that, the challenge perhaps is about what happens in schools and what the perception of the role of play um, in learning in schools is. And so we're going to try and you know, work on that. Um, as far as looking around at different places, I, I don't know if you want to say something yeah, about that. Well, maybe I can also speak to just to, to follow up on your point yep. on, the, on their first question. I think that you know we're going to be doing this work together with schools, but because we hope to sort of extract some principles from it, like what kinds of learning activities are going to produce these kinds of skills in children, that should be applicable to any context. So we're hoping that it could apply also to learning in a formal context, but we should think about those relationships, so that we, we agree. And then, um, yeah, to address the, the second question, um, we're really very open-minded about where we look in the world to get great examples of great playful pedagogies. I think that it's uh, nothing is excluded at this point, except maybe the amount of time we have to spend. <laughs> so uh, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we're very interested to know about your efforts in, in Jordan. And uh, we've already spoken to some colleagues from around the world who are on the advisory board for this playful writing project about their experiences in different cultures. So we would be uh, very open-minded. Clearly, a talk is needed afterwards. Can, you, uh... Can I? Let me just add something to that. There is actually... Um, already some nice evidence that came out of the United States last year in, a, in a, a nice study where they looked at the proportion of time children in the domestic context uh, had in what might be described as unstructured time. So this was, you know, times when children were allowed to just go and play with their friends in the park, um, you know, uh, were just playing with their friends you know, somewhere else that weren't being supervised by adults or, you know, as a formal class or something out of school. Um, and actually, interesting, they included in unstructured time things like days out at the seaside with the family or indeed visits to museums, you know, visits to other places of interest. And what that study showed, and again, you know, you're just looking at an association here and you always have to really delve deep, more deeply into these things and look at what are the causal mechanisms. Um, 
but what they what they found was was that there was an association between the amount of unstructured time children had, and therefore the opportunities for you know what you might call child initiated play, um, and um, the development of um, important skills that we know predict high levels of academic achievement. And these are broadly under the umbrella of what's referred to as self-regulation, which is the child's ability to be aware of and be in control of their own mental processes. And that develops quite early, begins to develop quite early in young children. And this, this particular study, is just one study, I think it's very indicative. And it's probably important to say that the sort of... Um, things that we'll be looking at, I hope, in the longitudinal study, and Marisol might like to add to this, would certainly include opportunities you know, for informal um, uh, play in, um, in, you know, in the domestic context, as well as what's happening in school. Do you want to add anything? Um, just to say that in the Millennium Cohort study that we will be looking at in the first instance in our research, they do include um, Formal and, and informal context, so hopefully we'll, we will be able to, to answer some questions about that. Hi, I'm Roberta Gollancroft, and I think what the LEGO Foundation is doing is amazing, and I love that they're partnering with Cambridge University and with this group who are asking all really interesting questions. And no one yet has mentioned media. And I think David's remarks reminded me of that. When children spend time alone now, they're often on tablets or watching television. And they might or might not consider that play, but that's one of the things that we want to study with Nora and Doris and Teresa on your advisory board. Because uh, one of the concerns that I have is that children's playtime, in the sense that we all experience play as kids, is going to be cut back even further given the amount of media that is available to children where they're swallowing other people's creativity as opposed to acting on their own initiative to create new things and put things together in novel ways. So I think whoever in your group is interested in media, I hope someone will be so that we can think about the effects that media will have on children in this generation. It's a whole new world. I thought someone wants to come back. Can the microphone come down to the front before they get? We've got time for two more questions after that. Does anyone want to respond? Well, just to say that you're absolutely right, Roberta. Uh, there is, as you know, a growing, uh, a growing research agenda in that kind of area. I think there's a lot of public general concern about the amount of screen time that even quite young children are engaging these days and what are the impacts of that. I and mean, I think it's an open question at the moment. I don't think there's anything defi definitive on it. But it's, it's clearly an issue that needs to be addressed. I don't think at the moment we're directly addressing that, but we're hoping to have you know, a bigger team when we get some more sponsors. <laughs> um, and you know, those are the kinds of important issues. And you, we can think of, we've already got you know, several other strands of research in the pipeline as soon as we get some generous donor like the Lego Foundation to help us to do that. So, the question at the front here. Yes. Uh, thanks for this evening. This is absolutely grand. Um, I'm from Barnhill School, and my two colleagues up there uh, are also from Barnhill School and uh, took part in this project. And uh, tomorrow we're going back to the classroom, uh, which in lots of ways is uh, a political mosh pit. And uh, it's, it's really important that we remember that as part of this project, is that teaching is fundamentally a political exercise um, at the moment. <laughs> now, and, and as I've been going through the evening, I've really enjoyed the, the inspiration and the aspiration and thinking, yes, yes, here we go. But we can't avoid the politics, both large P and little p. Um, whether apocryphal or not, Michael Gove is reported as saying on taking office, uh, kids don't need to have fun in school, uh, they just need to learn. And, uh, okay. <laughs> but I'm just curious, as we go forward in this project, will we be butting up against politics? Will we be avoiding it? Will we be going with it? How is that going to be addressed within this project? Well, of course, all the, all the politicians are advised, uh, are interested in the outcomes, and we can get we can get better outcomes by being playful. 
um, you know, that's uh, probably going to play in our favour. But, but I think Anne is the, the expert in this area, so... I mean, I think it comes back to the point that was the first question that we had about how is this going to make a difference to the system as a whole. And there's a long journey that you have to take. Um, whilst we might involve schools at this stage to make a difference nationally, you have to go from idea to proof to pilot to large-scale evaluation so that we can convince people that this really does work. And that's a long journey that we have to take. It is absolutely critical that we do. And along the way, of course, each step is absolutely vital. So the first stage of working with a number of schools in the local area to prove proof of concept. But that won't be enough. It's not until you can actually prove that it has an impact, not necessarily just on attainment, but at least not detrimental to attainment, that you're going to have some traction, would be my view. And it's certainly the ambition of the faculty to support that. Could, could I add to it as well? Because I think just putting a Lego Foundation hat on as opposed to a, a University of Cambridge pedal role but you know for the Lego Foundation part of our purpose is to change attitudes and behaviors of systems and governments towards learning through play um, of course it's also important to reach parents and teachers and others but we we know in reality they exist in larger ecosystems so we talk about systemic change and by systemic change we do mean the whole system including that so I very much agree that in practice you achieve that change by bringing the right evidence by bringing reasoned arguments uh, to the table by opening people's minds to things they haven't thought about. But um, I think we're only going to see change in this area if we're prepared to do that over time. Thank you. Okay, so we've got time for one more question. I think the person here had their hand up the longest. <laughs> um, so do you mind throwing it? People will be around no, after. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else got a um, um, is one quick point about the screen time. I think it's interesting. My son, who's a big Lego fan, he's um, playing a bit of Minecraft lately, which is obviously very influenced by Lego. And he does that in a very social, creative way. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that screen time is, is the big bad monster in the corner. But what I was going to uh, make, a, I was going to ask about Lego itself as a product. One of the things that I found interesting about the Lego Foundation is that the scope is so much wider than Lego as a product. It is, it's not all about um, how is Lego used. I was just wondering how much you were expecting to use Lego itself as a research tool and how much of your uh, vision is, is a lot wider than the brick, I suppose. <laughs> wider than the brick. Is that a question for me? That's a yeah. team. Yeah, I, um, do you know, we, we those, those questions are asked a lot of us as a foundation, and um, I think our perspective is, of course, we, we come out of the history and the heritage of the LEGO group, and we're extremely proud of that, and it's a product that brings a smile to millions of children's faces all over the world. It brought smiles to your faces when we brought it out earlier today, and we, and we think it's a product that's got some unique characteristics that, that actually are particularly open-ended, particularly creative. I often say to people, you know, a jigsaw only has one answer. Um, six Lego bricks have got 915 million answers or something in terms of how they're combined. So it is a very special thing. Um, that said, the Lego Foundation is about learning through play. And there are loads and loads of other ways in which children learn through play, which are equally as special and important. And, I, and I'd be very clear, we, we are interested in learning through play. Of course, when Lego Bricks help the research here, then we we'll probably can find a few supplies for you. That's not a problem. Um, but, but I can assure you, in terms of setting up this relationship and funding it, there is no obligation on this team to use uh, Lego Bricks in order to do that. That's, that's not our goal. So I'm afraid we're going to have to call the questions to a halt. But thank you for some very interesting questions from the audience. Um, and just wanted to end by saying, once again, a huge thank you to the Lego Foundation. David, I think you want to say a word about it. Um, well, just that I think uh, Thomas wanted to say a word or two now um, from the LEGO uh, Foundation side. So, yes, please. Thank you very much. Well, I know that uh, we are running a little bit out of time here, but uh, I just wanted to address you all and say thank you very much. It's uh, been an absolute privilege to be here today, listening to the panel and the speeches, and uh, be among so many enthusiastic people about uh, with the same goal in mind uh, that we need to do something to help children all over the world develop to the best they can and uh, that is 
our mission in the family and uh, also not only Lego Foundation but Lego Group as well. So it's an excellent question. Is it only going to be with Lego bricks? No, it's not. But we believe, as a family at least, that, uh, that the Lego idea, the Lego play, is one of the best ways to play and it, it, with the endless possibilities. And uh, so it's an option, but a very good one. <laughs> But it's been an amazing day, and uh, I'm really happy that we are now able to, to set up this uh, research center, and uh, I'm really proud that we, uh, we can be a part of that. So thank you very much to all of you uh, for setting that up. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That's terrific. I know some people have to dash off, but I do hope um, that some of you will now take the opportunity to do networking, to chat, to taste some of the delicious canapes that St. Catherine's College are very uh, uh, providing us with. Um, of course, I just need to finish by saying that a day like today doesn't happen, uh, you know, just um, by clicking your fingers and it comes out of thin air. Uh, there isn't time now to do it. If we, I've thanked everybody who's helped to make today such the success that I hope it has been and, and, and that it created so much interest in this area, we'd be here till, we wouldn't, nobody would get any canapes because we'd be, be here until half past six. But they know who they are, the administrative staff of the faculty, the technical crew, all the, all the, um, the people who've made the fabulous food that some of us have enjoyed during the day and you're about to enjoy, and so on. Of course, my esteemed colleagues here who've all been working um, in all sorts of interesting ways to make this happen. So I want to thank all of you, and I hope we'll get an opportunity to thank you more properly. Um, oh, and of course, I should say the teachers in the schools we've been working with, and of course, particularly the children, <laughs> who have been amazing. So thank you very much. I think this screen is now going to lift magically, and canapes and uh, all sorts <laughs> of exciting um, uh, comestibles will be available. So do please take the opportunity to, to meet. <laughs>